Hello everyone. This is a reading of a story I wrote for English class last June. I wanted to record it because I realized it has many similarities to the video game Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. Because I may want to update and expand the story in the later future, I wanted to show this story as a proof that it came before the game. With that being said, I understand that the similarities between the two are entirely coincidental. It should also be mentioned that the idea of sentient animatronics pioneered by Five Nights at Freddy's inspired parts of this story. With that being said, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy. Chapter 0, The Heat People always say nowadays, the world hasn't been the same since July 4th 1982, to the point of cliché, but being overused doesn't make it any less the truth. The heat was what came after the Cold War. The USSR and the United States finally went to war, and the stars and stripes flew high as the Soviets crumbled. Everyone would think this would lead to world peace as they were promised four years, but with all the nuclear destruction, America would face a major depression, and after 40 years, the country accepted the dream was dead. Nowadays due to the mass exodus to more prosperous countries, the population dying from the radiation, and low reproduction, there are around 10 million American citizens spread throughout the 50 states, with varying degrees of living. Some were barely touched, and others were wastelands left to rot, abandoned by the government. One of those states was home to the Tinhaman. Since the 30s they've had a growing empire of cartoons, toys, you name it. Every family knew it, and every person, child, or adult adored it. Its headquarters was Beaglewood, a theme park utopia, that was what some say was the biggest contribution to the heat. They had a huge advancement in robotics, which was used for their many animatronic characters, but those were very simple compared to what they could really make. Robotic soldiers lined the Soviet battlefield. They patrolled the forts of America. Toon Harmon had the fate of the war in their hands alongside the US government. When the victory came, the cleanup of the USSR's mess was America's next problem. Beaglewood was given a sister park. The post-war area venue of experimental living, or Pavel was built as the ideal living space in a nuclear fallout. It failed due to poor planning and high cost. Toon Harmon's only interest was the wealthy states, and if Pavel residents didn't have money, Toon Harmon wouldn't give them their promised aid. A tragedy of greed had struck the heart of the company, and all Pavel could do was hope they had a chance to leave, which was a near impossibility. There was a city that was free and prosperous. A solid rock, where people could truly live. Neon City used to be in many people's train of thought, but only so few got through, and after years of conditioning, people adjusted to the PAV. Chapter 1, In the PAV, the year was 2020, and Pavel was still stuck in the 20th century. A living time capsule of the 80s and 90s, from technology, to society. A basement dwelling Jeek's dreams come to life. Except this dream in the long run was a nightmare. The dome cloaking the entire city was a muggy yellow, and covered in scratches. There were only a few buildings made with care. Every day, the kids would go to the arcade, the library, the rental store, and the school. The rest was cookie-cutter architecture, caked with motivational posters and sars with the Tinhaman cast of characters plastered over anything they could be slapped onto. Pavel was built to have to have thousands of residents, making the place sprawl with life. After so many years, the bustling public didn't hide the stark lack of elegance and style. Revealed itself more and more. The growing filth didn't help either. Even if the Pavel citizens tried to keep their place as tidy as possible, the age of the place left everything permanently decayed, from the chipped walls to unlit neon signs. The streets never had the sounds of bustling crowds saying good morning, and how do you do, but the blown out speakers, 
played the same vexatious pop music every single day. Aside from restocking, Tun Harman rarely cared to improve the path. Every few years, their society slowed down in the trends of time. They started out with car liquor visions, then in 1995, the rental stores came out with Nintendo Entertainment Systems, then in 2001, they had the Sega Genesis. By 2005, the local library had a computer lab. Toon Harmon practically bought all the Pav's inventory at a flea market. It was cheap, and nobody was the wiser. Toon Harmon always had the upper hand. Moving out into a better city in a safe manner would require a lot more money than anyone had. Even if an entire family saved up their money, it would be good for just one person. It was intentionally rigged, so Pavel residents would be stuck forever giving their money to Beagle, and no one else. No risk, high reward. There were a few people that broke out of Pavel, in which the only place connected to it was Beaglewood. The last person was some 11-year-old girl by the name of Daisy Mae Robinson, which nobody even remembers anymore. Nobody truly knew what happened if you got caught running away. Nobody even knew if you could really get out of the park into a better place. Some knew about Neon City, but over time, the idea of a better place became a crazy rumor. So nobody dared to leave, and the few who had the guts to do it left everybody's memory. But two young teens had hope. Lucas was a young 15-year-old boy with a flowing brunette mullet. He was the bully of bullies. If anyone threatened him, he threatened them back, and while he wasn't violent, he had the temper to His life was pretty average, boringly so. He never exactly had friends, at least the kind of friends he saw on the TV, until he met a young girl named Lexi. She had saturated blonde hair, all wrapped up in a ponytail, and had sweet green eyes. Unlike Lucas, she was fairly social. Her family was quite big, and Lucas was quite happy being treated like one of their own. Lucas left school every other afternoon to visit Lex's place, where they regularly played video games, watched tapes together, and rode their bikes together. They were stuck in a dump, but their friendship started to make up for it. Sometimes Lex's grandfather had stories to tell about his experiences in Beaglewood before the heat. My love and I had our first kiss on the carousel. Every night they got under the covers and fell asleep, knowing nothing could harm them or their friendship. What if we broke out of the pav? Lucas said one day. Lexi thought over it. You and me, leaving this place and making better lives for ourselves. I mean I can't just leave my family. And I like Pavel. Why don't you? I don't want to justify living in a rut because it's just good enough to survive. I wanna actually live. I'd get out to this hellhole without a second thought. When you can leave at any time to a better place, why wouldn't you? So why don't you? Lexi said. With the raising of his eyebrows, Lucas found himself stumped. Well I'm not sure. Maybe I just need to feel like I'm ready. When do you think is ready? Lexi said. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe a year. The next morning the whole place was shocked hearing the sound of a parade float driving to the town square with rumbling machinery offset with distorted march music. A giant figure of Benny Beagle was waving to the empty crowds as two skinless endoskeletons drove. People started to notice and fled to the mysterious vehicle. A cartoon dog dressed in black coattails appeared and held a microphone. Good morning, one and all. Residents of Pavel, Benny Beagle itself said in a cheery pandering voice. I'm excited to announce that for the first time in 17 years, we have two lucky contestants with the bravery and courage to take the Beaglewood challenge. 
The two teens were a bit scared. Were they both being monitored? Did someone say something about them? Lucas Peters and Lexi McAllister, will you come up, please? Neither of them really had the courage to come, but two skinless endoskeletons nudged them forward, as inconspicuous as they could. They saw an animatronic of Benny Beagle, which was clearly very old, with unwashed eyes, and dirty fur. Neither of them didn't make a peep, and just smiled as Benny Beagle put his hands on their shoulders as they stood side by side. The crowd cheered in. Confusion, as the parade float slowly turned around, and made a course back towards Beaglewood. The Beagle took the two kids down to a hidden room inside the float. I must say, it must be very exciting to know what the Beaglewood experience is all about. What's going on? Lucas said, his eyebrows furrowed. Give you what you want of course. Beagle said, the cheeriness in his voice offsetting. The discomfort between the two kids. Wait, have you been? Lucas said, his voice growing into an uproar, before being cut off. This is all just a big game of cat and mouse you see. Just simply get from point A to B, with my merry gang of friends. Stop this now. Take US back. Lexi said, kicking the robot's legs. Benny Beagle made no reaction, and continued his speech. Fret not, little one. You don't have to be in any danger. All you need is your smarts, and hope your little kid legs are fast and quiet. Benny handed them a map of the park. You can strategize and see what's safe, and what's quick. Better be nimble, dear ones, you only have until dusk, or else the gates on the other side will be shut. Good luck, and good game, Benny Beagle said, as the doors to the outside of the float opened, pouring sunlight into the inside. Lucas reluctantly stepped outside, with Lexi following suit. Tiddles. Benny said, his voice trailing off. The same two Enders looked at them soullessly. Lucas and Lexi hoped that those Enders would be the least of their worries, but they knew there would be so so much worse. They looked around, back to back looking at the maze of land before them. The buildings were faded, but through the murky atmosphere, the colorful walls were there, as sweet as candy. The architecture was varied and had a handcrafted thoughtfulness to them, unlike the monochromatic packed boxy houses they've lived in. Old posters and signs with cartoon animals, and smiling faces were plastered over the walls like fleas on a dog. Bold words and phrases caught the teens. Eyes. Lexi remembered her grandfather talking about. Anamoya. He made it sound like such a wonderful feeling. As if you were living in the past, experiencing the things of old. For Pavel, it was the only thing they could have similar to nostalgia. She's had an amoya in her vocabulary for the longest time, but now he can truly feel it. Lucas couldn't have any idea what she was talking about. The two could hear faint sounds echoing through the streets. Clunking of machinery and settling in other buildings. Birds chirping by. It gave them the notion that they were safe, but they could be put into danger at any time. Be sneaky, Lucas whispered. And be very quiet, he continued, his words ghastly. They found an old round clock post on a street corner. It incorrectly read 10.37pm. It was clearly early afternoon. Knowing the correct time would be helpful, he thought to himself. Oops. Lexi said, a bit too loud. Inside, she said, pointing to an open door. An open shop, Sweeties, was open and they hurried inside. There was a scented aroma of delectable delights. The inside was entirely pink and baby blue, with expired candles covering the aisles. There was also a milkshake bar, with some booths. Lexi picked up a cookie shaped like Benny Beagle. On the back was an expiration date of August 1982. 
In the milkshake bar, bottles of chocolate and cherry syrup were sticky with sauce everywhere. It won't take that long to get to the other side. Will it? Lucas shrugged. Just want to plan ahead, if we need to. They really didn't know what to do, now that they were actually in the park. Did they want to rush to the end as fast as they could, or strategically stay in different locations? Going down the main hub, they found a map, and decided to plan out their pathway. So to our left, is backquote medieval magic, and then backquote phantom menagerie. To our right, is backquote captain's galaxy and backquote calamity canyon, Lucas said. And the exit is right there. Hey, a voice shouted cutting Lucas off. With wide eyes, they rushed to hide. You got some nerve to be thinking this stuff Marxy, a gruff mobster voice said. Ever thought for yourself, bud, another voice said, less gruff. You can't say you're doing your job for the money, when the money ain't common to ya.